A new world order. A new world order. A new world order. A new world order. Says the is the master race. The higher, higher, right in the poorest space. Not to love the poor is a great disgrace. So the higher, higher, right in the poorest space. Then Herr Gerbel says we own the world in space. The higher, higher, right in Herr Gerbel's face. Then Ho Goring says they'll never bomb this place. The high, high, right in Herr Goring's face. Is we not the Superman? Are we on Superman? Yeah, we is the Superman. Super duper Superman. Is this Nazi land so good? Would you leave it if you could? Yeah, this Nazi land is good. We would leave it if we could. We bring the world new order. Ayura Hitler's world in order. Everyone of foreign race will love the poorest face when we bring to the world disorder. Then the poor says the is the master race. The higher, higher, right in the poorest face, not to love the poorest face. So the higher, higher, right in the poorest face. So the higher, higher, right in the poorest face. The affirmative task we have now is uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Uh, a new world order. Uh, a new world order. We bring the world new order. From the ashes of World War One. Adolf Hitler attempted to build a sinister new world order, led by a so-called race of Aryan supermen, spreading a reign of terror unlike any the world had ever known. Many believe the Nazis conjured strange spirits and followed occult practices that had lain dormant in Europe for thousands of years. Now documents prove that their beliefs were based on a perversion of ancient pagan law, a twisting of mythic battles between forces of light and darkness, and a terrifying journey into a world ruled by mystics, madmen, and murderers. His inner circle, who had strong ties to the occult, would help him to accomplish this goal. Among them were Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess, whose correspondence reveals a devotion to astrology and forecasting by the stars. Nazi Commissioner for Philosophy and Education, Alfred Rosenberg, who wrote the book laying out the tenets of the Nazi religion. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, whose diary records his use of astrological forecasts in planning the war against the Allies. And Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS and the Nazi death camps, whose personal papers reveal that he was the master occultist of the Third Reich and ultimately the architect of the new Nazi religion. At the foundation of this new religion was an ancient occult legend that tells the story of a continent somewhere in the North Atlantic. There lived a race of super beings who had fallen from grace through evil and vice. A great flood wiped these beings off the face of the earth. But before they could all be destroyed, certain priests escaped by boat, eventually finding their way to India on the high peaks of Tibet. These escaped priests, believed by mystics to be the original race of Aryan godmen, were said to be the ancestors of all Indian and European people. 
The land was called Atlantis. Certain German mystics claimed the Atlantis myth was actual history. Their proof that Aryans were the chosen people descended from the super beings of Atlantis and that they had lost their powers by mating with mere mortals. In these theories lay the seeds of Nazi doctrine. Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, an extreme nationalist, made it his mission to prove that the Germanic peoples were the descendants of the Atlantic master race. Because the global order is changing again. And the institutions and rules that worked so well in the post-World War II era for decades, uh, they need to be strengthened. And some have to be changed. So we have to do what we do best. We have to lead. We have to lead. We have to update the global rules of the road. We have to, we have to do it in a way that maximizes benefits for everyone. Because obviously it's overwhelmingly in our interest. This is not a zero-sum game. It's overwhelmingly in our interest that China prosper, that Mongolia prosper, that nations big and large, east and west. Now, as you know, the title of this presentation is The Grand Design. But I should explain at the outset that the real subject behind this title is U.S. foreign policy. Now, I realize that there are some who might think that I was trying to be funny or sarcastic with that statement, because for a long time, there's been a generally accepted view that our foreign policy has been so bungled and confused that it couldn't possibly have followed any design, much less a grand one. <laughs> but, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of this presentation is to show not only that there is a grand design, but that it has been the consistent dominant force behind absolutely every major move by the United States in the foreign policy field since at least the end of World War II. This grand design has provided the motivation for all we have done in the past, and unless some basic changes are made, it will determine everything we shall do in the future. Now, regardless of one's opinion of this grand design, it's the outgrowth of a powerful and compelling argument, a profound statement of philosophy, and a deceptively attractive appeal to reason. And ladies and gentlemen, unless we are able to counter this argument and to offer a superior philosophy, we'll continue to be like putty in the hands of its advocates. So it's important, to say the least, for us to understand what the grand design is, to analyze it, in order to discover its flaws, if any, and then to offer a superior alternative, if we can. These three requirements, then, will constitute the general outline of the material and the ideas to be presented here. First, identification. Second, analysis. And third, solution. Now, to plunge right into the core of this challenge, what I'm going to do now is advocate the grand design just as though I really believed in it, which in all honesty, at one time I did. In fact, I'm going to teach it to you just the way it was taught to me at the University of Michigan. Now, following the form of what we might call uh, an extended syllogism, here is how the argument begins. One, we are living in a new age. And of course, you can't hardly argue with that. We're always living in a new age. But nevertheless, we're reminded of that profound fact rather elaborately. We're living in an age of marvelous and incredible technological advances, an age in which men travel faster than the speed of sound, in which satellites forge communication links between continents, in which space itself has become a limitless frontier of exploration. And then at the end of the list of all these wondrous and productive scientific achievements, Always we are reminded, with ominous overtones, that we also have something with us now called the bomb. End of step one, ready now for step two.
By the way, everything up to this point not only is true, it's so obviously true that it's really not part of the argument at all. It's merely thrown in at the beginning as a kind of conditioner to get us nodding our heads in agreement in hopes that the habit will carry over into the next step, which is where the going gets tricky and where we need to be far more on our guard. The next step then, the real premise of the grand design is this. If all-out war should develop today between major powers, both sides would lose. No one could come out ahead in that kind of a war. Everyone would lose. It wouldn't make any difference who the good guys were or who the bad guys were. It wouldn't make any difference who started it or even if it were started by accident. Both sides would lose. All right, now having acknowledged the existence of the bomb and having concluded that risking war is unthinkable in this modern age, we move now to step number three, which is this. Since the communists have nuclear weapons, and since they certainly would use them in their own self-defense, that means, doesn't it, that victory over communism is impossible. Now, we may wish that it were possible. We may wish that we were living in a bygone era in which if one had an enemy, he could meet him on the open battlefield and get it over with. We may wish that a lot of things were different in this old world. But instead of moaning and weeping and longing after those things which are no longer possible, let's grow up, be mature, intelligent human beings, and face life the way it really is. Rather than living in a fantasy world, dreaming and longing after those things we want but can never have, instead, let's find out what is the best we can get, and then work for that. All right, now the next step. It's not enough for us just to know that victory is impossible. For our own safety, we must conduct our foreign affairs in such a way as to reflect this knowledge to the other side. We must be extremely careful never to give the enemy any cause to question our benign intent. We must avoid using any words or committing any acts which might even suggest that we were pursuing a goal of victory. We can't afford to gamble on what the enemy might do in response. In other words, we mustn't frighten the communists or give them any cause for self-defensive panic. In fact, to take it one step further, we must avoid the temptation even to embarrass the Soviets in the eyes of the world. You see, the argument is that it's like being locked in a cage with a dangerous animal. You can't get out of the cage, and you can't kill the animal. So what do you do when it becomes hungry and restless? You feed it, hoping that if it's full and comfortable and contented, then it won't eat you. Obviously, it's overwhelmingly in our interest. This is not a zero-sum game. It's overwhelmingly in our interest that China prosper, that Mongolia prosper, that nations big and large, east and west. <laughs> well, the people who have created U.S. foreign policy over the past two decades view the United States as being locked in a worldwide cage with a dangerous animal called communism. We can't get out of the cage, obviously. And since victory is impossible, remember, we can't destroy the animal. So to minimize the chances of communism turning on us, these planners not only have avoided frightening the animal with any overt moves which it might mistakenly view as a threat to itself, but they've done everything possible to keep the beast fed, comfortable, and content. 